Okay, Patricia, I'm having some trouble getting it to appear. So give me just a second here. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I can hear you. I can hear okay. you well. Okay, so something weird is going on here. Should be oh, coming the, up. Yes. The, okay, is my presentation there now? Yes. I can okay. I can see it. Okay, so I'll put the from the start. Oh, okay. very good, now, very good. What I do is I shove me into the corner. So you'll need to switch. So um, it's one past three. I think I should introduce you. Okay. Um, Professor okay. Douglas McIntosh holds a PhD in Applied Microbiology from Harriot Watt University in Scotland. He was a postdoc at the University of Barcelona, Spain, and visiting researcher at Fiocruz. Currently, Dr. McIntosh is a professor at the Department of Animal Presentology of Federal Rural University of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And Professor McIntosh is a permanent member of our postgraduate program in veterinary sciences. Thank you very much, Professor, for accepting this invitation. And the subject of your talk is indeed very important. If you are watching us live, you can write your questions at the YouTube chat. Dr. Thais Azevedo and Dr. Viviani Magalhães will help us gathering the questions and passing them to Dr. McIntosh at the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Okay. So thanks very much, Patricia. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, representing our postgraduate course and giving a talk in uh, English, which is very important. It's one of the aspects that our, that our postgraduate course try to stimulate within our students because of the importance of the English language both for scientific presentation and because almost all the literature available in science is written in English. So it's very important that we, we do this. This is an activity that we have to do because since if we only speak in Portuguese, we only present in Portuguese, we're kind of limiting ourselves to a Portuguese audience or Portuguese speaking audience. And while that's a sizable audience, we really want our postgraduates, postgraduate courses efforts to be seen uh, globally. And the best way to do that is to present in English, yeah? So, the idea now is I'm going to give this presentation. And I'm hiding myself now. So you're only going to see the presentation. I may come back later on. Uh, so, the idea with this presentation, One Health is a very interesting subject. It's a subject that I teach at, the, at our university. I've been teaching it for the last four years now, and uh, I give a 40-hour 40 40-hour course on the subject of One Health and its relevance for veterinary science. That course is given in English, and the idea being, once again, to stimulate English activities amongst our, our student body. So along this course of the last four years and for the years before when I, I was aware of One Health, I always ask myself if One Health was working. And what I'd like to do today is let maybe go through a little bit of the history of One Health, look at how One Health has developed. And I'm asking this question, it's a bit of a provocative question, but it's a question that needs to be asked, which is One Health, talking the talk, but is it really walking the walk? Which in English signifies what? It's talking a lot about what it wants to do, but is it actually realizing any of its goals? So the idea with the presentation today is to look at this and, and maybe, unlikely, but maybe come to some kind of conclusion. So for those of you that don't know, One Health is the idea that the health of people is connected to the health of animals and our shared environments. The basic idea being that when we protect one aspect of this three regions, we protect them all. This information here is given by the CDC, which is one of the main players in this 
a One Health global effort, which has been going on for a bit more than 15 years. So what are the issues that we find within One Health? Well, actually, it's very, very far reaching. And that perhaps is one of the problems with One Health. So One Health includes main areas, zoonotic diseases, antibiotic resistance, food safety and food security. So that's making sure our food is safe to eat and making sure there's enough food for everybody on the planet to eat. The idea of vector-borne diseases are the diseases transmitted by mosquitoes, by ticks, for example, environmental health, chronic health, mental health, occupational health, and more. So you can see it really is a massive subject, and maybe that that's one of the reasons that a lot of talk goes on and not a lot of walking. But we'll see as we go through the slides. So this is the first slide that I present to my students when I talk about One Health. I ask the question, One Health, is it raising more questions than it's bringing answers? So what is One Health if you want to start with a few questions? Okay, so we can have a definition here, which the concept of One Health aims at approaching zoonotic diseases from a complex systems thinking perspective, yeah? encompassing local and global implications. It's a continuum of time scales and the interaction between different sectors that influence or influencing the occurrences of these zoonotic diseases. So here's another way that One Health has been represented in the literature using the idea of a word cloud in which the larger the words are represented, the more frequently those words are referenced in the literature in connection with this particular topic. So when a meta-analysis was done, I think this was done back in 2015, to ask what's One Health, the words which were most used were these ones here, the largest ones. So human-animal environment interface comes up a lot, collaboration, ecosystems, food safety, security, training, communications, then you start to see things getting a little bit smaller, multidisciplinary, land use. We're down here. Other words, mental health is very small. Epidemiology is small, surprisingly. And some other words as well. But the main words come up, human-animal environment interface, collaboration, food safety, security. So what should be the questions we're asking in this presentation or trying to get answers for, really? So is One Health really having any more impact than the old system, whereby everybody worked in their own areas? How many successes has One Health had? How many policy changes have been made either locally, nationally, or globally as a result of the One Health effort? And have we actually reduced the impact upon human, animal, or environmental health of any disease through a One Health action? Yeah. So how can we find out? Well, I'm going to tell you what I tell my students in almost every course I teach. You have to read. And if you want to read, the best place to find this information, all accumulated for you, pre-packaged, more than 300 papers for you guys to dig into, is this site here from the One Health Commission. So I recommend you go there. Yeah. Now, it's not only me who's asking this question. Almost every year, there's a paper or two which is published in the last decade, which is evaluating One Health, asking if we're demonstrating effectiveness. And as was shown in this paper here, which was published in the journal One Health, though emphasis on the evaluation of One Health has increased, the widely cited benefits of One Health approaches have been based on model projections rather than outcomes of implemented interventions. And that really is where we are still nowadays, I believe. We actually have a lot of talk about how we can implement One Health, but we don't really have a lot of data coming out which proves the outcomes of these implemented interventions. So, have you read a good book lately would be my next question. And if you haven't, I'm going to recommend three for you on the subject of One Health. The first two were published by the World Bank. People, Pathogens in Our Planets. Secondly, was published this one here, An Operational Framework for Strengthening Human, Animal, and Environmental Public Health Systems at Their Interface. And most recently, 
This book, which was published by a European organization, the Network for Evaluation for One Health, which, I, which provides information on integrated approaches to health, a handbook for the evaluation of One Health. These are all essential reading if you really want to get involved in this One Health movement. Increasingly, One Health, and this is since 2015, is being linked as one of the means by which we can attain the sustainable development goals which were uh, announced by United Nations member states in 2015 as a universal call to action and to end poverty. So increasingly One Health has been linked to trying to meet these goals. So one thing I'm not going to talk to you guys about today is COVID-19 or the SARS-CoV-2 virus because I'm actually today sandwiched in between two extensive webinars. On Monday, we had a very large webinar, four participants falling, talking about the raging pandemic, a steep learning curve. And tomorrow, we have another webinar from 4 o'clock in the afternoon to 6 o'clock. That's what time here? Uh, 11 o'clock in the morning till, or 1 o'clock, 11 in the morning to 1 in the afternoon. And it's regarding the risks of future pandemic threats and how to prepare. So the subject of COVID is being spoken about extensively, was spoken about on Monday, will spoken about, be spoken about again tomorrow. These webinars will also be available for people to see later. So no need for me to speak about COVID-19 in any detail. So a little bit of history about One Health. It's an old idea, yeah? Hippoc Hippocrates actually mentioned it. He's saying here in Greek that he supports One Health. So One Health has been approved. And if we jump forward to the uh, 19th century, we come up with the microbiologist, medic, and politician, Rudolf Virchow, who also said in German that he supports One Health. He also improved it. Now, Virchow was actually the guy who perceived the links between human and animal diseases and coined this term, zoonosis, that we hear almost every day nowadays on the media. So, later on in this century, we had a high inputs, and in the 20th century, we had large inputs into this area of zoonosis, human health interaction, involving these two people here. Calvin Schwab, who was a professor of veterinary medicine at UC Davis in California, and Dr. James H. Steele, who was the chief of, vet Republic, of the chief of the Vet Republic Health Division, at the CDC. So the CDC actually has a section which deals with veterinary public health. And Steele said that human and animal health are intrinsically, inextricably linked. They always have been and they always will be. So the concept of One Health is newer, as we know it now, is newer. It's essentially 16 years old. The word first appeared in the literature in 2004 when this researcher here, Karish, uh, working for the Wildlife Conservation Society, announced the term One World, One Health. And subsequently, four years later, the American Veterinary Medical Association, on July 15th, so it's actually coincidentally the same date as today, coined the term One Health and produced a report entitled One Health, a New Professional Imperative. And that was directly principally to veterinarians. And that came out of the One Health Commission. So we could say that One Health is 16 years old. So happy birthday to One Health there today. So what do we need to have to get an idea to work? We have to have a transfer of excitement. Yeah, that's what we require. So there's a pivotal moment in every project when one person is really excited about that idea. Yeah. And it might be even be a team of people that get excited about that idea. And the excited ones really believe that they're onto something. And they may even be correct. But being right usually isn't enough, yeah? In order to get the majority of projects off the ground, the excited people need to somehow transfer that excitement to others. It could be by selling the idea. It can be a form of storytelling. But whatever you want it, you have to effectively transfer that excitement. And this is the moment 
that most projects fail. When we're not able to turn that initial excitement into something more concrete, yeah? You go from all this hand slapping to how are we really going to get this to work? And perhaps this has happened a little bit with one hell. Maybe not even a little bit, maybe quite a lot with one hell. So why do we do one hell? Because the genetic similarity between a human and a chimpanzee is 96%, and the genetic similarity between a human and a banana is 60%. So all the organisms are interlinked on the planet. We all live on the same planet. We all have to coexist on it. So that's why we need One Health. Another view of One Health. One Health can be defined as any added value in terms of human and animal life saved, reduced cost, and sustained social and environmental services that can be achieved by a closer cooperation of human and animal health and other disciplines, which could not be achieved if the sectors worked separately. Who coined this phrase? was Professor Jakob Zinstag and his co-authors, and they published this in a paper entitled Climate Change in One Health, which was published in a journal called Environmental Microbiology. So we're looking at climate change, we're talking about One Health, and we're talking about this in a microbiology setting, which is all very One Health, very expansive. So. I can give you some examples of One Health working, but there aren't really that many for me to pull out of the literature to give you, okay? So this also comes from Professor Zinstag's paper there, published in 2018. He talks about added value to health service, uh, health services, added value to zoonose control, citing references for this here, improvements in surveillance and response to some diseases, he's talking about West Nile diseases, which save more than 1 million euros compared to separate human and animal surveillance. He's talking about infrastructure, World Bank are involved there providing this backup for this proof. And this idea here of communication is important as well, but he's using it as an example of what could have happened had we employed One Health, rather than an example of really One Health having worked. So, Working examples of One Health, it's a bit hard to find them. They do exist, you have to dig deep in the literature. Who is it that's trying to convince us that One Health works? There are various organizations behind this. We have the One Health Commission, we have the One Health Platform, the One Health Platform are organizing these webinars I mentioned earlier, and we have the One Health Initiative, another excellent organization. All, all three of them, working somewhat in unison, but also somewhat apart, unfortunately. Another organization which I recommend for all students, you can be involved and you should be involved in your local One Health groups as well, but this is an international group, the Students for One Health, which brings together international students to work together on trying to develop One Health ideas and local One Health actions. They organize meetings amongst themselves and everything. It's a fantastic organization and I encourage all students to get involved in it. So, One Health isn't only being sold by One Health organizations. We also have some other organizations which are trying to wake up the world and trying to stimulate interactive research in different areas as well. One of them is the Echo Health Alliance, okay, which probably aims to give lots of impact towards a improvements in how we deal with complex health problems, which can't be solved by reductionist single actions. They require systems thinking approaches. And these guys are pushing us as hard as the One Health people are from a slightly different angle. And then we also have the planetary health movement, which is being pushed by the journal The Lancet, which is a medical journal. And they're looking at interactions between the environment and health. They're looking at how migration works, water availability to water, impacts of pollution upon the oceans, the impacts of uh, agriculture, climate, economic, economic aspects, air quality, water quality. Not exactly one health, but well worth getting involved in and reading as well. If you really want to see how we can work together and bring benefits to animal, human, and environmental health. So, 
without doubt, as stated by the World Bank Group, the cost of us not doing anything to try and improve these areas is really not affordable. And it's especially not affordable for the poorest countries. So we have to improve public and veterinary health systems against major disease outbreaks. We're seeing this now. We weren't ready for the COVID-19 pandemic when it arrived. And another area which the World Bank is pushing hard in, at least in this piece of information here, is that we have to improve antimicrobial stewardship and reduce the overuse of both of these drugs for both animal and human health. And I will talk a little bit about this later on in the speech today. So once again, we're back to this slide, which shows you the somewhat simplified idea of these three areas coming together to give us One Health. But One Health is actually a bit more complicated. Here we see another model for One Health in which you have the same three areas in the middle, but we start to stick more areas and more topics around that central figure and maybe some emphasis given to things like human medicine, veterinary medicine, ecology, cycles and reservoirs, and then emphasis on public health and zoonosis. But you'll also see there are many other things in here, cultural practices, ecotoxicology, urbanization, evolutionary medicine, antimicrobial resistance. So this model expands our vision of what One Health should be. And you start to see, well, how am I going to manage to work in all these things? Is this workable? So another idea, another model that's put forward, which actually even brings in another component, is the famous One Health umbrella. Now under this umbrella model, which was made by One Health Sweden, we have environmental health, ecology, veterinary medicine, public health, human medicine, molecular and molecular biology and microbiology and health economics. Under those, we have individual population and ecosystem health coming together. We have a single area here encompassing many things, zoonotic infections, food safety, antibiotic resistance, vector-borne infections, interventions, vaccines, surveillance, vector control, sanitation, and another area here, which I'm really not qualified to speak about, since I'm not a vet, but which is also included in One Health, which is the area of comparative medicine and translational medicine. So the big One Health topics are what? Antibiotic resistance, emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases, neglected diseases, food safety, food security, climate change, land use change, eco-health, and they all come together there. Translational medicine is also down there. So, One Health is, oh, what happened there? The big One Health topics. The main issue that seems to be affecting and driving, the main driver for these One Health topics that we're seeing are changes in land use. Urbanization, uh, deforestation, uh, increased agriculture. International travel and commerce is also involved, wars and famines, climate changes, breakdowns in public health, consumption of bush meat. These are things here. This is data from 2008, and really there has been no other major study done as well as this one, topically, recently, to update these, these issues for us. But it's widely held that land use change is probably the principal driver for the one Health problems that we are currently seeing. So One Health, in my opinion, the opinion of a lot of the literature, is fragmented, okay? Instead of us all being together under one umbrella, everybody is under their own umbrella. And these pair here aren't even under the umbrella. So where do we get this information from? Well, there was a publication here from 2016, highly cited, One Health or Three, publication silos amongst the One Health disciplines, which showed that a lot of researchers are contributing to this cross-disciplinary group of journals, but the publications from veterinarians and ecologists in this topic remain segregated into discrete communities. Also, veterinary and ecology communities regularly reference this broad cross-disciplinary group, but they only rarely cite each other, and medical journals are contributing with very few papers on the subject of One Health. 
So One Health apparently has precipitated a great deal of research interest in infectious diseases, but it's not fully overcome these barriers that segregate the disciplines that form One Health, veterinary, med human medicine, and environmental science. Yeah? So, uh, analysis was done more recently, 2008, published in the Lancet Planetary Health, in which they looked at the growth and strategic functioning of One Health networks. They performed a systematic analysis of that, and they attempt to determine if there was a duplication of efforts between these groups, which stakeholders are being engaged actively by these groups, and whether there's actually monitoring and evalu evaluation of the investments that are being made in One Health. We analyzed 100 unique One Health networks. We found that 32 of these networks only covered human and animal health. So essentially, they weren't really One Health. 78 were involved academic bodies and government bodies. Community groups were involved in only 10 of these. Few collaborations existed exclusively between networks in the developing world, which is where most One Health action is needed. And only 15 of the 100 uh, networks reported monitoring and evaluation of information in relation to their activities. So not really a very good result. And the interpretation of this study was that it provides empirical evidence about limitations in stakeholder representation, an apparent absent or somewhat ambiguous monitoring and evaluation structures and a large potential for areas of duplication in one health. So not really functioning very well, yeah? And they recommended that more collaborations should be made by networks within the developing world led by them, and that there should be an obvious increased attention to environmental health. So this was their suggestion, but is that actually happening? The answer is no. This is data from a, a book entitled Towards Understanding the Interplay of Environmental Stresses, Infectious Disease, and Human Health, in which they did a PubMed search in 2019 for the 10 years previous, and they collected 40,000, almost 41,000 environmental health articles and 53,000 infectious disease articles, and only 0.5% of those articles overlap. So, probably not really resolving the silos just yet would be the thing there. Now, another area which seems to be neglected within this area of One Health is the incorporation of social science into One Health. Probably in part because we don't speak the same languages, it's difficult for us to interact. And this was beautifully uh, demonstrated in this article here. The Promise and Pitfalls of Social Science Research in Emergency, published by researchers from Phil Cruz in Rio de Janeiro and other cities in Brazil, and people from the London School for Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And there, it's important to realize that it's not only real scientists, in inverted commas, that should be involved in One Health, because social science generates evidence that's necessary for the control, necessary to control academics, it helps us to craft appropriate public health responses, develop solutions to the epidemic's impact, and improve our understanding of why the epidemic occurred. So social sciences have to get more involved in One Health. Otherwise, we're just going to keep talking and not walking. We need to work better together. We need to be like the Justice League, bringing together lots of different superheroes to resolve our problems. So. One Health is 16, 16 today. It's actually 12 today, but it had four years previously, but it's essentially an adolescent. So as an adolescent, you could envisage One Health as shouting for attention, constantly arguing with the older areas of science, trying to convince them that it is the way to go ahead. But like many adolescents, One Health's become a little bit neponistic, a little bit, uh, what's what I'm looking for, a little bit... Uh, self-absorbed, okay? It's looking at itself, thinking it's great. On the other hand, like many adolescents, it goes through periods of inertia as well. And it would be fair to say, I think, that One Health is a bit like a teenager's bedroom, something of a mess. 
So who's actually behind One Health? If we look at the demographics of One Health, we find that although it's an adolescent, the demographics of the leaders in this movement are actually a little bit older. The average age would be greater than 45 years old. The majority are Caucasians, more than 90%. National, the principal nationalities involved would be North Americans and Europeans, based on the information gleaned from participation in main meetings and publications in One Health. But the majority have projects in developing countries. More than 90% of all people involved in One Health are university-based science, scientists. So we don't have that much input coming from the private sector. And despite being a subject that should be divided into three equal parts, 80% plus of the people involved in One Health are veterinarians. Now, that probably makes sense because it came from a veterinarian start. But perhaps you would have expected things to have evened out a little bit better over the last 16 years. So why is this happening? The average teenage brain is made up of lots of different parts. It's actually growing. And during adolescence, there's, the adolescence is marked by important brain changes in which you have an, a pruning, a removal of excess gray matter. And that's associated with learning. So I think you could probably say that the adolescent One Health brain is still going through this process, really trying to find out where it's going. And it would probably be fair to say that One Health has something of an identity crisis, hasn't quite decided what it's going to be when it grows up. So we've got these old guys in there, but are they doing any new tricks? Or are they really just selling us something that's going to be a passing fashion? None of these clothes would really last much anywhere, would they? I hope not. Anyway. So we're talking about infectious diseases. And the idea was that the, these diseases have receded in the Western countries during the 20th century. Urban sanitation, improved housing, personal hygiene, antisepsis, vaccination, antibiotics all came together to give us increased longevity and increased wealth. And if we take figures published by the CDC, we look at them here, these are the data from 1900 to 2000, we see that yes, if we take the influenza pandemic out of the equation, there's been a constant fall, use of penicillin, salt vaccines, passage of the Vaccination Assistance Act, coming up to 20,000 or 2000, we really were looking pretty good in terms of the impact of infectious diseases on the crude death rate, at least in the United States as a result of, of interactions from, from modern medicine. And you could actually see there in the 20th century that Sir Frank McFarlane Burnett said in 1962, Burnett was a Nobel Prize winner for medicine physiology, a virologist, that one can think of the middle of the 20th century as the end of one of the most important revolutions in history. Virtual elimination of infectious disease is a significant factor in social life. Later in 1972, as if he was talking about the weather, Burnett and David White, another prominent, a prominent microbiologist, said the most likely forecast about the future of infectious diseases is that it will be very dull or uninteresting. We acknowledge that there was a risk for some wholly unexpected emergence of a new and dangerous infectious disease, but they didn't think it was so likely. And as a result, epidemics appeared to have become of interest only to historians. But once again, it's difficult to make predictions, and it's dangerous as well, because you're often proved wrong. And maybe it's not so dull to work with infectious diseases anymore. Here's a result from ProMed, which is a site you can link via the One Health initiative. And you'll find here maps of the world showing you once again in the word cloud diseases that are returning or emerging throughout the world. So there's nowhere in the world, Antarctica's not on the map, but there's nowhere on the other continents where infectious diseases haven't returned, haven't emerged, and we're suffering a lot of problems. Another image would be this here, where the importance of animal life, both wildlife and domestic animals, including terrestrial animals and marine animals, you can't forget that 70% of the planet is covered with water, and the animals in there can also act as reservoirs for some zoonotic diseases. So 
wildlife and animals, once again, all over the planet, probably waiting to give us some new diseases if and when we decide to encroach on their environments. So maybe it's not so dumb, yeah? So big topic number one, antibiotic resistance. According to this paper published here, antibiotic resistance is the quintessential One Health in, uh, issue, the most important one. But is it really? Let's see. And the values, the things given for this, the ideas that sell this idea, is that there's a prediction being made that we'll be suffering 10 million deaths annually as a result of antibiotic resistance, and that this will bring an economic cost of approximately 66 trillion pounds to the world economy. So economic costs are going to be steep, and the number of people dying are going to be very, very high as well. If we look at the deaths attributable to antibiotic antimicrobial resistance every year compared to other major causes of death, by 2050, we're going to be up at this 10 million mark, at which point it may actually be the leading cause of death on the planet, much higher even than cancer. So, where can this come around by? It comes around by numerous factors, but one of them is obviously too many people on the planet, we're all overcrowding, we're in contact continually, the bacteria that have these resistances are in our everyday environments, in this case here, a very crowded swimming pool in China, and if somebody in the swimming pool has an antibiotic resistant bacteria, there's a good chance that everybody is going to acquire it. Whether it will keep it is another question. So who's to blame for antibiotic resistance? Well, there are numerous causes and numerous sources which are given. The main causes which are given are basically overuse of antibiotics in agriculture or inappropriate use of antibiotics in human medicine. Either way, we're introducing too many of these drugs in an uncontrolled way into our environment. We circulate the bacteria which respond to them and become resistant to them, then circulate, and we have this distribution between the different environmental components of these antibiotic resistant bacteria. So, how do we look at this? How is it this? How has our knowledge in relation to this come along since we started studying antibiotic resistance research? Antibiotic resistance research has undergone an exemplary evolution. We start off with relatively simple phenotypic testing using disc assays. We have progressed to this more advanced system, the e-test system, where we can quantify more effectively phenotypic drug resistance. There was a move in the 1990s towards molecular analysis and characterization of antibiotic resistance. I worked in this area during the 1990s in relation to aquaculture, production of, the, of, of aquatic animals. And we worked there, we used sequencing, we used restriction analysis of plasmids, we mapped things. In the 2000s, I also worked furthermore, we used a lot more advanced sequencing, analysis of plasmids. We were able to show links between plasmids and uh, antibiotic-resistant fish pathogens, which were highly related to plasmids coming from antibiotic-resistant foodborne pathogens. So lots of good information being published on this. We were able to type and demonstrate our organisms using techniques like post-field gel electrophoresis. We can also look at techniques based on sequencing, where we sequence multiple genes, multiple locus sequence typing. We can also use multi locus variable, variable number of times and repeat analysis in which we go even more finely into the genetics of the organism. We now have techniques like matrix assisted laser desorption ionization, MALDI-TOF, which let us identify the bacteria with high degrees of specificity. And nowadays we have the coming tsunami of next generation DNA sequencing, which is being put forward by many people as the best way for us to try and do something to really, really determine who are the organisms involved in this. So, how do we work with antibiotic resistance? We have to have an optimization of the ecological balance. This paper here discusses this very well. In this image, they show you the balance between the factors that will have effects upon the effectiveness and the factors which are working against the effectiveness of any actions we take to try and curb antimicrobial resistance. 
This side here, we can see we have a lack of awareness amongst veterinarians, the public, amongst medics. We have excess use in animal husbandry, poor infection control practices in hospitals, inappropriate antimicrobial use in humans. We don't have new antibiotics being developed. And in some countries, we still have the availability of antibiotics that can be bought freely in pharmacies, although that's decreasing. So why does this happen? Well, because as you can see in this map here, bacteria are very adaptable. The humans develop an antibiotic, the bacteria develop resistance to it. The resistance already existed. It was in other bacteria in the same, in the same environment. They simply cross-talk, acquired that resistance. Once they got it, they tend to hang on to it and or spread it around to other bacteria. So we can see here that it's been 30 years since a new class of antibiotic was last introduced. So we don't have many antibiotics left to play with, and we don't have many new antibiotics coming. So it's a bit of a perfect storm. So the solutions to this are more likely to be political and less scientific. I think it could be argued. If you look at this list here of the positive trends in trying to balance this ecological problem, we have the often spoke about idea of antimicrobial stewardship and where we're going to control better the use of antibiotics in hospitals and animal disease, educational initiatives to help doctors change the way they prescribe drugs, government legislation to ban the non-therapeutic use of antibiotics, that's not use antibiotics as growth promoters in agriculture, for instance. Some incentives coming from world governments to try and encourage the pharmaceutical industry to reinvest in making new antibiotics or discovering new antibiotics and guidelines at local, national, and international levels. Yeah? And efforts to enhance the value of antimicrobial agents in the future. So most of these factors here are really political. They involve investment from governments in changing attitudes. The use of new, antib new antibiotics would be great, but it's probably only going to give us the same problem again. So when we look at antibiotic resistance in one health, perhaps we need to change our focus from doing all this high-tech science to trying to focus more on some more political uh, solutions. So if you look at the dynamic of the problem, and this is an, a graph that I just knocked up, no numbers definite to give you here, but based on my readings of the literature, we can look at the number and diversity of antimicrobial resistant bacteria, the diversity of resistance genotypes, the complexity of the methods and the quantity of information you can obtain. We look at the number of scientific papers on characterization of antimicrobial resistance. And what do we see? They all grow exponentially. So we've got more antibiotic resistant bacteria than we ever had. We have more complex methods for analyzing them. And we have loads more scientific papers on the subject. But in reality, what we don't have is progress towards the control of the problem. So perhaps what we really need to do is a bigger focus on political solutions and a little less investment on broad scale application of these technologies, just generating more information. Basic research is great, but it has to be balanced with having effects. So I think in this area, One Health does a lot of talking, but it doesn't do a lot of walking. So, idea that's come through is the idea of next generation sequencing and it's being given everybody says now we have to sequence everything down to the last nucleotide inside them but it's actually having a bit of a a, a, a backlash in so far as it's long being postulated and it's often taught by people who teach one health that the transfer of antibiotic resistance from animals to humans is actively occurring and it's probably occurring via the food chain yeah, but recent studies, and this is only one of them, employing One Health genomic surveillance of Eshwisha coli demonstrates the opposite. You have distinct linked lineages and mobile genetic elements in isolates from humans versus livestock, and no real link with the food chain. So we have to be, how much money are we investing to try and find these things out using such high tech? only to discover that probably because of the limitations of how many samples we can examine because of the costs, 
we're really not going to make much progress if we keep just applying this kind of technological driven uh, attempt to find a solution to the problem of antibiotic resistance. So, talking about zoonosis, 60% of existing human infectious diseases are zoonotic. Yeah? This is information from the OIE, which is the equivalent of the World Health Organization for Animals. 75%, at least, of emerging infection diseases of humans, including Ebola, HIV, influenza, and probably COVID-19, have an animal origin. And this is a figure that always surprises me. I don't know where they pull it from, but we'll believe it. Five new human diseases appear every year, and three are of animal origin. Okay? And each year, it's estimated that zoonoses, these diseases shared between people and animals, cause 2.5 billion cases of sickness and 2.7 million deaths. So that's a lot of people dying for something that we could probably control better than we do. So we have zoonoses which are related to the food chain production. These are outbreaks of viral diseases in humans which originated in or spread through farm animals. Avian flu, H5N1, the swine flu outbreak of 2009, H1N1. These have caused major global alerts in the last decade. In fact, the H5N1 is probably the driver which really stimulated the growth of the One Health movement. Yeah? So H1N1 was characterized by WHO as a pandemic, spread very quickly either in animals, okay, these things, the H5N1, or directly in the human populations, the H1N1. So our understanding of these epidemics it's getting better. We still have a lot of stuff to do. Watch definitely the, the uh, webinar tomorrow for more information on this or read more about it. But it's fair to say that the total disease burden related to the academic, the endemic bacterial zoonoses, which would be Campylobacter, Salmonella, for instance, in the food chain, are probably many fold higher than caused by these influenza outbreaks. COVID, I'm not too sure. Yeah? But basically, these relatively flu few, but which clearly are global outbreaks, which put One Health on the global agenda. So when we look at the zoonotes related in the food production chain, we're probably giving a bit too much attention once again to these pandemics and epidemics, which draw far more attention to these insidious, much more prevalent, but much more widely distributed problems which don't gain the same intelligence, but which also need to be resolved. So, is there a lack of preparedness? This is really what we're looking at. Yes, there is, as has been shown by COVID-19. As I said, I'm not going to talk about COVID-19. I'll just talk quickly about the lack, the lack of preparedness, which was clearly demonstrated by COVID-19. The failure to predict or even to monitor disease spread in animals is there. And this gave regulators, we thought, a wake-up call. And we thought that things would be done because our clear message of could do better was given by our inability to respond to H1N1 as an example. And there are pressures for current and future emerging and re-emerging zoonoses. We have international travel, we have international trade, these are widely recognized. The movement of populations which shaping the patterns and distribution of infectious diseases globally. SARS, West Nile virus, COVID-19, Ebola, they're all the outcome of these factors. The uh, animals involved in them, in SARS, we believe it was this organism here, the civet cat, West Nile the virus involves birds. Ebola involves a complex chain of key involving bat, the consumption of bats, and the consumption of different animals as bushmeats. And this little guy here, the pangolin, we really don't know if he is implicated in the spread of COVID-19, but he's certainly getting a lot of attention. These animals, most of them, are animals which suffer a large impacts from humans, both as the hunting via encroachment on their environments and in drug trafficking. The pangolin, for example, its scales are used in the preparation of some traditional Chinese medicines. 
So SARS was the first emerging infectious disease in the 21st century, and until COVID-19, no infectious disease spread so fast or as far as SARS did in 2003, although the impact was relatively limited. We only had 8,400 cases and 812 deaths. Over 30 countries took seven to eight months. But it was a wake-up call. We needed to respond to it. What did it teach us? That an infectious disease in one country is a threat to all. Important role for air travel and international spread was clearly demonstrated. And the economic impacts of just those number of cases, the fear generated by that disease, the measures that had to be implemented, cost, big costs and losses to tourism, trade and travel. Nothing in comparison to what we're seeing now, but impacting. And we should have woken up to this. This was 2003, this was 17 years ago. So we recognize that high level commitment is crucial for rapid containment. We recognize that the WHO can play a critical role in catalyzing involve international cooperation and support. They produce documents for this. Global partnerships and the rapid sharing of information enhances preparedness and response. Did it happen in the latest outbreak? Yes, but not as quickly as it could have done. There are political and language barriers. You can't do this. You can't stay quiet about these diseases. We have to be open about it as a global community. One Health has to do this. We're just talking. We're not managing to get it to work. So, highly pathogenic avian influenza, this was what everybody was scared about, but he's been pushed aside a little bit by uh, COVID and the other coronaviruses. But Time published an article on this years ago saying we're not ready for the next pandemic. We had time. We didn't use it wisely. Did One Health manage to have its impact? Not really. So... Coming out of COVID-19, we really, really have to rethink how we're going to react to these kind of events, yeah? So, one of the ideas, once again, that's being published or, or boosted is the idea, our old dog with new tricks again, to go down this high-tech surveillance route again and invest heavily in that. Surveillance has to be part of any option we use, but we have to balance the cost of surveillance against the return on it? Can we actually turn our surveillance data into predictions of who is going to be the next pandemic virus? At the moment, I would say no. Yeah? Some people would say yes. But we're still in a position where surveillance is important. But we can't shift everything over to surveillance. We can't take all our resources, particularly in resource-limited countries, and turn it over to surveillance. Yeah? An example of this here is a comparative analysis of rodent and small mammal virulence to better understand wildlife origin of emerging infectious diseases, published in 2018. Sampling thousands of rodents and bats, looking for viruses, characterizing the viruses genetically, and not really managing to tell us where the next virus, the next pandemic was going to come from. Will this get better over time? Almost certainly. But at the moment, we can't just take a knee-jerk reaction and try and throw all our resources into this. We have to sit back, discuss, think a lot more about how we're really going to deal and use effectively these molecular surveillance techniques which are coming out now. Clearly, we have to because the relationship from time to detection of emerging pathogen to its cumulative cost of control coming from the World Bank in 2012 is this here. It's a lot more expensive to control than it is to try and identify early on in the emergence of an organism when it's going to do something, when it's going to make that jump from animals to humans. But we don't really have that information just yet. We need to sit down and think a lot more about how we're going to get that information and how we can effectively use our existing resources to do that without taking money from other areas of research. It's a difficult, difficult balance, and one help has to be involved in there. So if we look at the case, another case specific here in Brazil, we also have to be very careful about how we deal with the information we generate from One Health studies. We can't go scaring people.
We can't be sensationalist. We have to be more cautious in how we actually use our information. And this is an example here of the armadillo, the so-called tattoo here in Brazil. So here they are, nice animals, mammals, which some people in some regions of Brazil use as a food source, okay? It's actually illegal to hunt these, but it goes on. So here you can see some animals which are prepared for being sold. Here you have another man, he's probably caught this himself and he's preparing it to eat. And the reason that we're interested in looking at this within One Health is the investigation of potential for potential non-human reservoirs of mycobacterium leprae. Because studies have shown that mycobacterium leprae, the bacteria that causes leprosy, the infections, air, infections by that microorganism are not limited to humans. We know it can survive in the environment, has been detected in some arthropods, and it's been found in animals. Low numbers found in non-human primates. It's also been detected in red squirrels, including studies in Scotland where they found it in red squirrels. And it's been found in armadillos, yeah? Because the armadillo is actually the consolidated animal model for the culture of the bacillus, because mycobacterium leprae doesn't grow at all in, non, in vitro. On, on agar plates, like most other bacteria do. It has to be cultured in vivo, and the model used is the tattoo. So it was shown in 2011 in the US using a combination of comparative genotyping, subtyping of single nucleotide polymorphism, whole genome sequencing, that strains of mycobacterium leprae are shared between, between tattoos, between armadillos, and humans. This has been proven convincingly there in the United States. And studies in Brazil have also looked at this. And we really haven't managed to prove in Brazil that leprosy is a zoonotic disease in the same way that it apparently is in the United States. Yeah? We have a number of studies done in different regions of the country employing serological, molecular, and histopological methods, traditional epidemiological methods, but we've yet to really apply the same molecular epidemiology that's been applied in the U.S., you know, some studies are ongoing at this at the moment. Now, we had this paper here, which was published, which claimed to provide evidence of zoonotic leprosy and risks associated with human contact or consumption of armadillos. And this got a lot of press, both nationally and internationally. But there was a certain degree of sensationalism in the way that this was reported, in this particular report, not so much, because they gave a balanced report. The main problem with this study was it tested 16 animals, and it talked to 150, approximately, humans to generate the data from this study. Not really a very large sample, is it? But it says that humans gave leprosy to armadillos, now they're giving it back. But look how it was reported in the general press. 62% of armadillos in the Brazilian Amazon have the leprae bacteria. And this was sold as if it was a major problem, that we're going to have huge outbreaks of leprosy or the tattoo and consumption of it or contact with it is responsible for disease in humans. It wasn't proven. We're working with 16 animals. 62%, it just gives the impression it's a huge problem. If you put there, 16 tattoos were found to have, or 10 out of 16 tattoos in reality, were found to have a uh, emilepry, you may not think it's quite so important. But the requirement to get funding, the retirement, the requirement to, for visibility of what we do, sometimes drives us to be sensationalist, and we can't be sensationalist with one health. We're putting a, a shot in our own foot if we do that. So food safety, another big issue. Here's one of the reasons we have problems in food safety. This is a, a, a chicken processing factory. Look how many people are processing chickens here. It's, a, an, open, it's an open system for transference of pathogens between animals and the food product that's going to be produced at the end of the day, no matter how well you try and control that. We also have the problem that some of the agents we work in, they're responsible for diseases transmitted to us, zoonoses transmitted via food, 
they circulate between humans, wild animals, and domesticated animals. They're all over the place. We have this huge mixture going on there. So another example. So we can try and improve our lives by eating organic foods, yeah? If we look at it, we should call it 0104H4 bacteria, which is an intro-aggregated E. coli. It can kill you if you eat it, if you find it in your food, which was reported as being found in organic fenugreek sprouts, this plant here, which were produced from contaminated seeds imported from Egypt. Although, it has to be stated that this was never convincingly proved, okay? This actually happened. Now, contamination is believed to have been via animal feces, although the source of that feces was never identified. But 4,000 people were infected by this outbreak. 53 of them died, and 51 of them were in Germany, which is why probably a had such a high impact. What happened in this outbreak is really quite interesting because initially what happened was that the German scientists incorrectly blamed imported Spanish cucumbers as being the source of this, which had a huge economic impact on Spanish exporters of all kinds of fresh vegetables. They lost up to 200 million US dollars per week yeah, and spent subsequently tried to process or, or sue the German government for having linked it to the E. coli outbreak. Russia completely banned the purchase of uh, European uh, fresh produce for months in response to this process. So you have to be careful. Once again, lots of high-tech uh, next generation sequencing, full genome sequencing done to identify the organism, which looks like this under electron microscope. And the question is, how can this happen? Yeah, How can this happen? It can happen because we take feces directly from livestock, and instead of composting them to this inactivate pathogens, they're directly applied to the vegetables, and the vegetables come back into our, into our food sources. Or during animal processing, we contaminate meat with fecal material as the same process. We contaminate soils, or we contaminate dairy projects produce and inappropriate treatment of those products leads to the introduction of these organisms into our diets. So, said here that sustainable organic farming can help reverse climate change, but only if it's practiced properly. Otherwise, you can have transfer of E. coli coming in and through unrecognized up to that time sources, fresh fruit and vegetables, resulting in numerous cases of disease and human death. So this is another example here showing that One Health was actually being practiced even before One Health was invented officially. And we have an epidemic of hepatitis A, which was attributed to ingestion of prawns in Shanghai. How did this happen? This case was more obvious. It was an outbreak or a breakdown in sewage treatment that led to contamination of the water sources in which the clams were being produced, and you see them there, they're filter feeders, they got full of uh, hepatitis A virus, which you're seeing here, and they were then consumed quickly, relatively soon after this initial exposure, resulting in 300,000 cases over a two-month period, okay? So, what happened was that the Chinese authorities very quickly produced ways of improving. First off, they resolved the basic problem of the, of the sewage contamination. They then uh, invested into new means of producing these clams using depuration, treatment of the animals. Once they were being produced, you take them out, transfer them to fresh water, let them purify themselves, and they were able to reduce very quickly the titers of any virus within those animals. And they also developed a live uh, vaccine for hepatitis A, which is safe and immunogenic and is used or could be used for the prevention of epidemics in the future. So that was back in 1990. So One Health can work if you get the people together, environmental scientists working with veterinarians, working with medical doctors, you can produce effects. But for some reason, we don't really manage to do it very well. So how are we going to get there? It's obvious that education is the answer almost always is. So how do we educate in One Health? 
that you have undergraduate courses in One Health. Seems unlikely. More likely we would have postgraduate courses where we bring these people together, medics, environmental scientists, economists, lawyers, social scientists, veterinarians who want to work in One Health to develop what we call One Health competency. These two articles I'm showing to you here both raise the question of how we can do that, what we can do, we're at a crossroads, we really need to improve our education, we need to take the competencies which we find in veterinary scientists, human health scientists, environmental scientists, combine those to generate these One Health core competencies. So, it's viewed that these are the way we're going to manage to get people to get One Health to work. Instead of just talking, it's going to start walking. So, we need to use these competencies to try and develop curricula for this. We need to have training in management, how to work with multidisciplinary teams. We need to have training in communication and informatics, how to use diplomacy, how to negotiate, how to achieve collaboration. We need to have an ethical approach to all of this. We need to develop leadership. We need to have defenders of change. We need to have people who have an external conscience, social, political, legal, and cultural. We need to have collaboration, the ability to share, to identify shared values and goals, and to think strategically. But primarily, we need systems thinking, in which people are trained to have an awareness of the overall picture and the interdependence of the different stakeholders that understand and want to adopt a One Health approach. You have to be able to identify the problem and the impact on the system. That's key. So the main areas which are represented in postgraduate programs, areas which were not highly represented are plant biology, antimicrobial resistance, and law. We have reasonable, uh, uh, reasonable representation of zoonoses, emerging infectious diseases, economics, conservation of wildlife, and the very well represented ones would be epidemiology, environmental and health ecology, okay? These data all come from those two articles I showed you before. There haven't been many articles published since then, but the basic idea is still the same. And this figure here is the outcome of numerous meetings by different One Health groups that try to identify these key components, the, co the competencies that would make for effective One Health science. And we really need them if One Health is going to stop just talking and start walking. So this map showing you, and this was taken off the internet just the other day, so I believe it's actual. This is where you find masters and PhD programs throughout the world which are based on One Health. So we can see there's actually quite a large movement, and this information is provided once again by the One Health Commission. Here in Brazil, we are actually starting a program, a professional master's program in One Health, Saúde Única, which will start at the Federal Rural University of Pernambuco. It was planned to start this semester, I believe, but because of COVID, it didn't happen. But in Brazil also, we're beginning to dip our toes into One Health education. And we really have to. So, one of the questions I always ask when I talk about One Health is how many doctors are watching this presentation at this moment? I would imagine not so many. I may be wrong. And why is it that medical doctors or the medical profession isn't really getting itself into One Health? Is this the main reason that we're primarily talking and not walking? Could be one of the main reasons. So, there are a number of articles that discuss this, what needs to be done to resolve it. Interestingly, the first article you'll find about it was actually written in a veterinary, it was published in the veterinary journal, a physician's view to One Health challenges and opportunities. Points out very clearly what the problems are. Since then, there have been other ones. One Health Education for Future Physicians in the Age of Humans, that was in 2017, and incorporating One Health into medical education published in a medical journal here, but really relative to the size of the resistance against incorporation of medics into One Health, the literature on why this is happening is really quite limited. So we really need to address this problem, and try and do something about it, because if One Health is meant to involve three categories, 
we're not managing to do it. So here in Brazil, or Latin America in general, we believe strongly that veterinarians are and should be involved in public health. They have demonstrated ability and competence to work in various areas, epidemiology, sanitary, environmental surveillance. They can work at the individual health level, advising physicians and government stakeholders on the potential risk of transmission of zoonotic diseases. They can work in the area of collective health, analyzing threats for zoonotic diseases, using modern surveillance systems, domestic wild animals, human populations, in order to guide more effective control methods. And we should be stimulating a lot more research into this should be funding more research in Latin America on this human-animal interaction, more studies, basic studies on, uh, on One Health human-animal interface. That's what we need to have going on. So we have programs here, and we have to encourage our younger veterinary students to get involved in this. This probably means introducing them to these ideas earlier in their veterinary training. If we can do that, we can probably cause something of a turnaround from the trend, which is for more younger veterinarians to move into animal clinical practices. And, and few veterinarians moving into this public health or one health area. Hopefully, we will change that a little bit here in Brazil. And if we can, one health will start to walk. So let's have a quick look now at this idea here, which is the One Health Cosmos, which is the largest model or the nearest model which is being provided for what One Health is. So once you start looking at this model, you begin to see just how extensive One Health is and how hard it is for us to really get One Health to work. Maybe we've let it get too big. So now we're including, importantly, it's not there, it didn't happen, it should have been here. We're including areas, including biodiversity. We're including animal health, human health, ecosystem health. We have vaccination, epidemiology, veterinary medicine, global health, health policy, media, economy, globalization, the three areas of animals, wildlife, livestock, and our companion animals, zoonosis firmly in the middle. It's become enormous. Can we really work inside this huge uh, cosmos? It's hard to say. What one else needs is evidence-based science. Yeah. We need to call people to work on these subjects. We need to make it attractive. We need evidence that One Health is working, that's validated evidence, which demonstrates the added value, as Zinsteg suggested, of One Health in socioeconomic terms. It can be used to inform policy decisions. That's the only way that One Health is going to be sustainable. When we have successful national, regional, or global One Health practices, that have cost-effective critical intervention points. We have to show the feasibility of doing that. We have to show that there are impacts if, if One Health is going to be a sustainable entity. We need to start to produce estimates for what they call the total societal burden of emerging and endemic zoonoses. Yeah? That can be used to provide compelling evidence for the value of putting One Health approaches into operation to take the place of the existing single silo systems that exist. So One Health's global, but it can be local. It would probably be fair to say that America started on the right track, but in some ways in the USA, One Health started to become something of a business. The Europeans are trying to get it back on track. The, uh, the evaluation of One Health movement was asking uncomfortable questions, but even there, the train has probably derailed and the idea of One Health is spreading all over the place, but not in a compact and formed way. Yeah? Our modern universities, where most of these ideas are coming from, have become technological cathedrals. And we have to think about how we can move ahead. Education, we have to go back to a basic approach. I've said in the past, and I'll say again now, that I think that One Health has been kidnapped somewhat by high-tech approaches. They tend to suck our resources and put them into given centers rather than letting a re-democratization of our research occur, whereby lower tech methods can be used by more groups to generate 
more information, maybe not with the same degree of, of precision that you have using high tech, but very good information. So omics, catalogomics, big data, information technology are kind of swamping over one health. It's embracing it, but maybe too strongly. So if we look at technology, technology can work against you. We have numerous examples of this, one here being a cautionary tale about the dangers of big data was the use of computation in the Vietnamese war to try and determine how they would win the war. Instead of having precision bombing, they went for carpet bombing. They bombed everywhere. And as a result, they expended lots of energy and they didn't get the results they wanted. But this was predicted to be the way to go forward by the big data. Didn't work. Same thing could be happening there. We're moving back to a kind of Cartesian point of view of the way we do science. We've progressed away from what should be a holistic and a systematic approach to science, and we're going back to a more reductionist point where the catches indicates that we should break things down to their parts. But in this reductionist, this mechanistic paradigm that the Cartes uh, proposed, in spite of some obvious contributions, we have a lot more information, this analytical method provokes an attitude of reductionism in what we're doing. And it's based on this belief that all aspects of complex phenomena can be understood if reduced to their constituent parts. And that's probably wrong. Yeah? Now, what we're doing in Brazil, in some part, and I'm using a football analogy here, in 2010, 2014, and 2018, Brazil did not win the World Cup which is a big disappointment here in Brazil for the nation because Brazil is the world of football. Yeah? So why did this happen? A lot of observers have said that this happened because Brazil was trying to play European football against European teams, and it didn't work. It came with a high-tech approach to playing football. It didn't work. So using this analogy for One Health, I believe that we need to go back here in Brazil to playing football like it was done in the 1970s when Pele and his, and his friends managed to win various World Cups for Brazil. We need to go back to using and playing One Health the way we can do it here in Brazil. We need to be a little less MPB, which is uh, popular Brazilian music, and a little bit more heavy metal. Yeah? Here we have Caetano Veloso singing a song called Alone on His Own. What we need to be doing is being a bit more like Slipknot where everybody's working in conjunction to make a good noise. That's what we need to do. So, where One Health isn't happening, okay? One Health problems that take place around the globe, but they're more relevant in the developing world than the developed world. We're seeing here, yeah? But most research on One Health is published and or presented by North American and European research groups. So it tends to implement One Health strategies I've had some, but for somewhat limited success. Lots of factors behind that. We've discussed a number of them today. And there's a growing awareness that scientists on their own can't make One Health work. We need to have new partners, economists, psychologists, lawyers, marketing specialists, and administrators. But if we do that, we're probably going to need an even bigger umbrella than the one we've been under so far. So this One Health initiative has to be applauded, okay? The solutions to implementing or the solutions for it may not lie, however, and as an implementing methods found suitable for the developed world. One size isn't going to fit all. We have to go back to playing pelly type football. Yeah? So how can we replace deforestation? How can we replace open burning or free-range poultry farming? These are practices that go on in various parts of the developed world. Maybe ecotourism could work, but it's not going to make that big, a, that big an impact. Education and more subtle approaches made by researchers from within the country who understand the dynamics of this need to be done. We need a more pragmatic and an innovative approach, as well as a kind of shift in the model that, we need to, that we're using, that we can really turn One Health from a dream into reality. Yeah? We need economics, uh, econom economists. We need health policy makers. We have to get the politicians on board. It's going to be hard. We need social workers. 
and we need to improve and continually get more report or more support from NGOs, including the Bill and, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Perhaps for smaller actions that really begin to show that one health can work. And that may be as important as engaging this global scientific community if we're really going to manage to implement One Health Initiative here in the developing world. But it's going to be tough. We're suffering drastic cuts in the resources we have available for research here in Brazil at the moment. In 2019, we were only getting 3.7 billion uh, reais, but in comparison in 2014, we were getting 9.2. So we're getting approximately less than half at a time when our national, uh, our national uh, moeda, our national currency, is being drastically reduced in value because of the ongoing global economic crisis. So we have a lot less money. We have to be a lot more innovative in how we're going to use it to get One Health to work here. We so desperately need to have it working. So is there a degree of neo-colonialism going on within uh, One Health? Hard to say, but probably a bit. There's been suggestions that the huge, uh, uh, the huge uh, investments in sequencing technology, which are happening in China, are in part to give them a certain dominance over the world genetics. Is that happening? I don't know, but there certainly are the world leaders nowadays in terms of capacity for sequencing. Here's a map of how things were when Britain ruled the waves, and we really don't want to we go back to that. There are lots of countries being dominated by one single country here. Yeah? Even in the days when Portugal was ruling large parts of the world as well. We don't want this, really. And as this image shows here, this is the flag of the world, the world flag, which we plan to plant probably on Mars at some point in the future. So there's probably a, quite a lot of neocolonialism going on, and we have to resist that some more. We have to be the main players in our own one Health actions without obstructing or not having open dialogue with international researchers. So how to go ahead? Two things again. Read this book. This book is fantastic. And also visit this site here from the Association of American Veterinary Medical Colleges, in which they get very nice One Health case studies for where we can get good ideas about how we can develop real One Health here in the developed world. That's what we want to do. So one of the things we need to do, we need to get our house in order. If epidemiology is so important, we have to have a checklist for how we use epidemiology in uh, One Health reports. Methodological differences cause big problems between trying to compare data. We can't get things to work if we aren't all using the same ideas. So this is an idea here, the checklist for health Health Epidemiological Reporting of Evidence, go here. An excellent initiative needs to continue to be pushed hard. Taking a planetary vision for One Health, we need to open the doors and make more collaboration between those apparent collaborators. The planetary health groups, the global health groups, the eco health groups, we all have to come together. We can't keep trying to fight between one another. It's not going to help the cause for One Health. So, also something else as a microbiologist, increasingly we have to consider one health relationships between human, animal, and environmental microbiomes. This is an area that's coming on to, to dominate many areas of biological and life sciences research, and one health won't escape either. We already have the example of microbiota manipulation, whereby we in fact, uh, the dengue mosquito here, it is Egypti, with a bacteria called Wolbachia, which affects the ability or reduces the ability of that mosquito to become infected with the dengue virus and then subsequently transfer it to uh, humans. So, excellent, excellent science, excellent idea for improving world health, a real One Health approach. We're using Wolbachia there. Here's an example of it. You can see the video here. We have a mosquito here which was transformed or infected with uh, Wolbachia. In this particular case, it was an unexpected, an unexpected phenotype. The proboscis of the animal is uh, unable to penetrate the skin. This wasn't the main effect of the 
of the introduction of rollback, it was an unexpected effect and perhaps a warning that we don't really know what we're doing at the moment when we mess around with the microbioma. These organisms will be unable to survive because they can't get a blood meal. But that's not the objective we were after. So some caution, perhaps, in how we use microbiomes in our approach to One Health. Very good high technology there again. So we may need this bigger umbrella, and there exists one in China. This, this structure actually does exist. So we're getting to the end of my talk here now. So there in 2008, the uh, initiative for One Health came up with a number of attributable benefits. So perhaps now on its birthday, we can have a look and see how we're doing. Yeah? So the first one was the integration of human and veterinary wildlife disease, environmental health disciplines, multiple levels necessary uh, to face increasing challenges to health, nutrition, security, and economic growth worldwide. So that would give us three out of 10 at the moment for that. Yeah? An area where we're doing pretty well is improved surveillance, recognition, diagnosis, investigation, not so much prevention and control of emerging and re-emerging diseases, especially zoonoses. So we've made a good effort there, seven out of 10, yeah? We have an increased knowledge of the factors responsible for this species jumping, maybe five out of 10. A reduced regional and global economic disruption by the emerging diseases. Really one health hasn't got there yet, so really only a two out of 10. Improved food safety in the global economy, which is dependent on this import-export market. Once again, I'm not convinced by literature I've read, so 2 out of 10 for that. More rapid sustainable development of emerging economies through improved human animal and animal health and productivity of food animals. Once again, not much of an effort or much progress there either. 3 out of 10. We stipulated or thought that perhaps One Health would encourage more rapid and efficient discovery and development of drugs for human and animal health. Once again, rather poor show there. I'm only getting a one out of ten. Uh, these areas, I'm unable to comment. Those are the translational medicine comments. Enhanced education and training of veterinarians, physicians, and allied scientists. Very good job with veterinarians. Physicians and allied scientists, not so good. So overall, no. Four. But where we really are doing well, and we're producing a lot of, of information, at least discussions of the subject, are the creation and dissemination of new knowledge on infectious disease ecology, one health, to enable our adoption of more effective strategies for disease control and prevention. So we end on a high note there with eight out of 10. Yeah. So, how are we doing? Are we getting there? Or are we still in this situation here? If we go back in time and we look at the tale told by Hans Christian Andersen of the emperor's new clothes, One Health tends to suffer a little bit from this still. Everybody talks about it as if it's something fantastic that's having lots of effects, okay? We're widely acclaiming it, but other people are questioning whether what has been created by One Health is actually having any value. I believe it is, but it's not fulfilling its potential and not fulfilling it by a long way yet. We have to have a rethought on how we're doing One Health. Here's the king walking with his new clothes, which in reality were no clothes. We also have another phrase now, okay, in English, which is the elephant in the room, which is an important and obvious topic which everyone present is aware of, but which isn't discussed as such discussion is considered to be uncomfortable. So in this image you can see here, the woman is not paying attention at all to this elephant that's taking over her living room, even though it's blending in with the wallpaper, which hides it even more. But we need to discuss more. One Health has to be about open discussions of the problems we have in One Health as well. Now, here we go here, and you could ask yourself now, One Health is 16 years old. What do you want to be when you grow up? And One Health actually gave us an answer, the One Health platform did, this, this year. They published a white paper in which they said they want to make science evolve into a One Health approach to improve health and security. A white paper published on it in the One Health Outlook. An excellent paper, 
very well written, very extensive, should be read by everybody. But when we look at our question of neocolonialism, perhaps we should have had some more authors from the developing world involved in these plans, because the authors were primarily Europeans. And even the author who was here from Singapore, he was himself a European. So we have Europeans, USA, Canada, essentially taking these decisions. Perhaps we need to open the game a bit more and bring in scientists from the developing world. So here's a phrase by somebody called Marcus Lemonis. I have no idea who he is, but I saw this, and this impressed me, this site. This, this image impressed me, which I saw on the internet. So I'm citing Marcus who came up with the information. And he said that performance is the best way to shut people up. So if you want people like me to stop complaining about One Health, we have to really start doing One Health. We have to walk the walk, yeah? Like these guys are doing here. We have animals, we have foodstuffs, we have people of all races and genders in this continually moving image here. And to quote Martin Luther King Jr., he said that if you can't fly, you can run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. And that's what One Health has to do. Probably it's going to move, change, it's going to morph into other things. It may even fragment once again into some subdivisions. But it has to start walking. We can't just keep talking. And this is an image that I often use to depict one health, the students here, is the Bisho de Sed Chikabesis, a seven-headed animal. That's what one health is. It's a chimera. And it has to be studied as such. And we can do that. And we're trying to do it here in Brazil. We're trying to do it here at the Federal Rural University of Rio de Janeiro. And we're trying to do it in collaboration with other partners nationally and internationally. So let's all do it. So thank you all very much. Thanks once again for the opportunity to have this presentation. Very important presentation, I believe. And I'm now open to receive any questions. So I'm waiting to find out if you guys have any questions for me. Let's see. OK. So. Got some questions coming in here. So first question. Recently there were debates addressing the concept of one health and the control of zoonoses. There may be a conflict of interest between health institutions and food industry. What's your opinion about the relationship between one health and food production? Well, how can I say about one health and food production? And Obviously, you're quite right, there are going to be conflicts of interest because we have this argument. Can we produce, taking antibiotic resistance as, a, as an example, can we produce low-cost food for the growing population? Can we ensure food security, enough food for everybody, without the use of antibiotics, for instance? If One Health is telling you you shouldn't be using antibiotics, you have to find alternatives to it. The food industry may not accept those arguments, our scientific arguments. We have to prove convincingly via one health based approaches that yes, we can make improvements to your production without cutting too much your profits. We see that there are moves here in Brazil, for instance, you can now buy organically reared chicken. To go to the supermarket, it's been a while since I've been to a supermarket, but when I was going to the supermarket prior to the, to the start of this uh, pandemic, what did we see? You have three different areas in your freezers in the supermarket. The bulk produced chicken, which is being produced for maybe five reais a kilo. The mid-priced chicken, where they maybe still use antibiotics when they have to use them. And you have the... Uh, totally organic free chicken, which is 15 rice a kilo. So it's not really quite as simple as food, food industry versus uh, One Health. It's all about economics. The economics are what really drives it. And that's where One Health has to come in and convince the food producers and the food industry 
that the application of One Health approaches is actually not going to be detrimental to their industry. It's actually going to be beneficial. And unfortunately, we still haven't managed to do that awfully effectively just yet. And now we have, like the study I showed you there, a number of papers coming out which are providing evidence, although I believe the evidence is flawed because of the size of the size of the samples and some methodological problems in the studies that are giving evidence against this spread of antibiotic resistance from the animal sector via food into the human sector. So it's very complex. We need to talk a lot more. We need to find a better way of convincing the food industry that you should follow the information from science that indicates that these practices are not good practices for the animal health, for environmental health, or for human health. But we haven't quite got there yet. So I hope that answers your question there, Jessica. Very good question. So how important is disease prediction for One Health? How can we improve the predictiveness of disease outbreaks with pandemic potential? Well, that's a, that's a key question, yeah? Now, I'm not a specialist on this, okay? But I keep an eye on it. I watch what's happening. I've seen what's happening. I had a rather astounding, uh, astounding piece of information, which was that yesterday, was on Monday, rather, in the, uh, the webinar from the One Health Group, scientists from Australia said there are currently 50,000 genome sequences available for the COVID-1 uh, virus or the SARS-2, the SARS-CoV-2 virus because it's COVID-19, yeah? So is that a worthwhile e exercise? We have the technology to do it. Do we really need 50,000 sequences available for the virus? Because it's been a massive sequencing operation. It's been done trying to determine if the virus that's doing the current pandemic is mutating and how that how those mutations could affect plans for viruses or vaccines excuse me or for uh, the formation of newly more pathogenic variants of this virus so apparently no is the response from what they're doing there there doesn't seem to be much mutation going on when you go back in time and you look at the study which was produced by the Chinese and American groups, where they used One Health, where they used next generation sequencing to monitor the virons, detect which are all the viruses which they found in rodents and bats in a population, I think it was as many as, as many, a few thousand samples were examined. They found hundreds of different strains uh, or at least sequences associated with the viruses. And what can you do with that? We can't really predict where the next virus is going to come from. Yeah? There are various sequences that were known in data banks of coronaviruses prior to the emergence of, of SARS-CoV-2, which are similar, but predicted by the systems used at that time not to be problematic or Hold potential for pandemics. It's still a very, very embryonic science. How we transform that sequence data into a biological outcome is very, very complicated. Yeah, and particularly in the case of human disease, because how can we determine if a given virus, even if we have the virus isolated, and there you begin to have this problem? Yeah, should we really be going out? and accumulating huge collections of potentially pandemic viruses from wildlife and storing them in laboratories. Should we be doing that? Probably yes, would be my point of view. We should gradually collect them, making sure we have the biosecurity in place to manage this. This has to be a, something that's done with, with great care, yeah, because of the risks of escape or whatever that could happen. Yeah? So we have to be very careful with that. But we have those viruses there. How do we then decide if it has pandemic potential for humans? We can't infect humans with these vaccines to determine if they're going to cause disease. 
So it's always going to be speculative. Yeah, We're sitting waiting for mutations to happen in the H5N1 avian flu. We've been talking about this for a long time. Is it going to mutate and turn into a pandemic virus? I don't think we can. I think if we learned one thing, although we lost some time, but I think if we learned one thing is that we, from from the, the COVID-19 uh, COVID situation, what we now know is, is that if we work together, if we combine our efforts, we can very quickly at least identify mother weeks, days even, probably in the future, if we improve our, our capabilities in this. Once we identify the presence of a new disease in a given population, the steps to having, if it's a viral disease, the steps to having its entire genome sequence are very quick. So we can quickly, at least at the molecular level, identify that organism. So in those situations, do we really need all that surveillance? Knowing that all these other viruses exist, can we effectively transform that information into some kind of universal vaccine against coronaviruses? Well, the coronaviruses have been studied for a long time, and we don't seem to be able to do that. I think the differences between the different viruses are probably too large. Is there a magic key antigen that we can make for all, all coronaviruses? I don't know. So should we continue to do surveillance? Getting back to your question there, Patricia. Yes. But it has to be tempered by the fact that not just surveillance that's going to get us in a position to be ready for pandemics. We have to invest a lot more in basic health care. We have to invest in improved methods for wide-scale wide uh, detection of people who are infected with these, with these viruses or these other, whatever agent that's causing the disease. So surveillance, super important. But we really have to balance it and see cost to benefit. Who's going to cover the costs for doing this? Is it basic research in universities that's going to find this? Probably no. You're going to need a, a global government level, world government level surveillance programs. And it has to be universal. So it's, it's very interesting, but I really don't know if we can actually improve that. So the question from Valeska. How could social science providers be more involved in the concept of One Health? By coming to veterinary departments, by going, principally the veterinary departments, finding the people who are working on One Health and asking them where social scientists can fit in. Yeah? Well, it's a bit of an uncomfortable question because we always say we need more input from economists, social scientists, administrators, marketing people. We don't speak the same languages. So, I think the short answer for you, Valeska, is that we, you have to come and knock on the door and we have to start talking a lot more. You don't find many social scientists involved in the papers which are published on One Health by veterinary groups. We need to have more. So come and talk. That would be my, uh, my advice for you for that one. But obviously the, the impacts once you're in, you bring a whole different skill set, you bring a whole new vision to the way that you look at the problems, and by combining the vision of social sciences with the scientific aspects brought by the environmental scientists, the veterinary scientists, and the medical medics, we have a much more fuller idea of the why behind any one of these problems we're looking at. Because the societal aspects are huge in almost all the things we look at, and are overlooked by us because we don't know how to measure them. That's why we need social scientists. Okay. Now here from can organic agroecological production systems effectively contribute to one health? If used if used wisely, yes. And I'll give you an interesting example for that. We realize that we're moving towards a major food food security crisis in the globe. We can't produce enough food apparently for the planet, cost effectively and safely. And one of the areas that's really growing is the possibility, the idea that we could use insects as food sources, either to eat them directly 
or to use them as sources of oils or proteins which we can incorporate into our foodstuffs. Yeah? And one of the organisms that's being touted a lot is being examined by various groups around the world, and we actually have some real progress going on with this, with this organism here. It's called the black soldier fly. This fly can grow on anything. You give it anything to eat, and it will convert it into high-quality protein. So I believe that is something that we could really be doing. We can try and work this, these kind of insect production systems into our ability to, get, to treat animal wastes, to treat leftover rubbish, to treat... a uh, Organic products, for instance, the beer industry produces thousands of tons every week of leftover grain. Once you produce the fantastic liquid that's called beer, you have this left grain, which is it's, it's very difficult to get rid of. You can't feed it directly to animals, but it doesn't provide much in the way of biomass exchange for, for a cow, for instance. It tends to generate the production of methane, which is a uh, 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 global warming gas. So you really don't want a lot of that going on. And uh, using those animals, you can treat or use low-value organic material that would otherwise just be thrown away or used as a, a low-value food source for larger animals to produce high-quality proteins, which can be used either directly as foodstuff for humans or more likely as a foodstuff for a fish farming or for pig farming or for some other area. So that would be interesting. I'm not really up on, on the dynamics of other areas of, of organic farming, but obviously organic farming has to be practiced carefully to make sure that the plants that we're producing, free of insecticides and whatever, don't bring with them infectious agents like as we should call it, or like hepatitis A virus, which was a case with green onions in Mexico in the 1990s, imported hepatitis virus into the US uh, via 